All right. I, 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 you're alive. It just said we're alive. So hi, everybody. Anybody that is tuning in, uh, welcome to the seventh edition of Celebrating the Brand Ambassador. So my name is Elaine Duff. I'm your host. And you probably already know that because you're probably watching my page. Um, I was going to say, Nicola and Dave, if you want to put it on your page, you can actually stream it to yours as well. Uh, and with me, I'm very excited today to have two of my favorite Canadians. I do love Canadians. You guys all really are the nicest people. Uh, <laughs> my best friend is in Toronto as well. Um, uh, Nicola Risk of McAllen and Dave Mitten of uh, Lot 40, but of all of Canada whiskeys. You're like the face of Canadian whiskey, Dave. So if you have your best like black <laughs> shirt, you're doing double denim, you're like, you know, representing. So, <laughs> so thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having <laughs> so us. Excited. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't a trick question. <laughs> so, um, all right. So I'm going to start off with a very basic question. So I'm going to start with you, Dave. So uh, what brand do you work for or brands and what are your responsibilities in that role? I look after a few different Canadian whiskey brands. Uh, I'll look after the entire family of the JP Weiser's portfolio, which is a pretty well-known Canadian whiskey, certainly here in Canada. I look after all the craft range uh, focused on Lot 40, Gooder Heaven Warts, High Creek. But I'll also look after all of our other Canadian spirits if needed, depending on what country uh, we're in. Uh, and my role, I mean, as a global brand ambassador, uh, creating educational content for sure is a big thing. Uh, category lifestyle content for social media. You've got to be the storyteller, the educator, the entertainer. Uh, Nicola would probably agree the road warrior, uh, and essentially yeah. the face of the brand. Uh, so we're <laughs> used when it comes to podcasts, interviews, television spots. We'll get out there and spread the gospel of the category and certainly the brand cocktail creation, event creation, activation, management, and then relationship management between importers, distributors, sales representatives, and then all the teams from brand teams, trade marketing, sales. We kind of bring everybody together, I guess you could say. Fair enough. That, Among that's many other lot. things. <laughs> that's a lot for one person to be <laughs> handling. And, and before we go into it, Nicola, that that is an like you know that is a workload for like you know an executive or a president or a CEO. Uh, so brand ambassador doesn't even seem like you know the right title for all of that. But uh, it is uh, an impressive thing that you know you have to manage and handle, and a lot of people you have to network and and deal with on a daily basis. I want to give a shout out to Brian Van Flandern who says, love all three of you, cheers. And Ian Tuck says, what a lineup. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so I'm um, glad, and thank you for tuning in. So um, Nicola, so what is your job title and what is your role? Like, what, what are you responsible for? So I work for the McAllen Single Malt Scotch Whiskey as a European brand ambassador focused on Central and Southern Europe, as well as brand education manager for Europe South. Basically, uh, in, uh, a lot of what Dave has just described is similar to what I do <laughs> over here from a European standpoint. So I always look at my role as an ambassador and I work with you know five different specific groups. Uh, there's five different branches, really. So managing internal education for my internal team with Edrington here, which is our parent mm -hmm. company. Um, and then all of our third party distributors. So working with the brand managers, the sales force, et cetera, et cetera, everyone on their team, um, educating and inspiring them on the McAllen and on Scotch whiskey as a category. And then also with the trade, of course, both on and off premise and uh, talking all things whiskey with them. Uh, the media doing interviews and podcasts and 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 whatnot as well as uh the public and uh, i think that what's interesting with a whiskey brand ambassador specifically and please tell me if i'm wrong on this but i think a whiskey ambassador has more public facing time um with the with the, the whiskey enthusiasts so those who are passionate about 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 whiskey as a category um, and diving in and having those conversations more than any other ambassador. Uh, because we have these there's more whiskey fests, right? There's more, I think yeah. there's more, I mean, there's definitely rum fests, but there definitely, there's 
probably rum is probably the second one I see the most exactly. of, but whiskey, definitely there is so many whiskey festivals and, and there are definitely a lot of whiskey. It's been around such a long time. It's obviously rum has, but like whiskey kind of, you know, it has this reputation of being something kind of, you know, elite, like a status, like there's a status symbol attached to it, you know, where, and, and then there's like, just, I'm going to enjoy a good shot and a beer, but there's definitely, <laughs> there's definitely like all sorts of levels with whiskey. Um, and every spirit category has it, but I think whiskey has definitely established it, you know, uh, and, and, and is more accessible to most people like cognac definitely has it, but not everybody drinks cognac or brandy where whiskey, I think everybody has at least had some, even if they snuck it out of their dad's cabinet. I think that there's just, you know, there's such an incredible whiskey community globally and there's such a huge passion for it. And people adore the opportunity to come together, whether it be online or whether it be in person, to be able to enjoy a dram, explore whiskey, talk about their favorites, what they like about about different whiskeys and whatnot. And as an ambassador, it's it's for me, it's such a joy to be able to do that with anyone who wants to dive into flavors, dive into exploring the liquid and and getting into those details. So it's, uh, uh, yes, the whiskey festivals are huge and it's nice to see that over the last five to 10 years, those rum festivals have started to grow also. Um, and then it's a brand new, yeah. I'm gonna cut so, you off for a second because David, yeah. you represent Canadian whiskey. Like it definitely, you know, that's a big, that's a thing that many people are not as familiar with. Um, do you see it growing? Uh Certainly. I mean, I always joke, but it's kind of half serious. I think it's one of the most misunderstood spirit categories in the world. And touching on what you and Nicola were saying, it's it's endless education on whiskey and so many different types of whiskeys from different countries and then styles from each country. Like it's, it's endless, the knowledge that you can learn something new every day. And okay. Canadian whiskey in the last decade, certainly even more in the last few years. Uh, I mean, you notice because you have spirit writers, you have festivals, more people are intrigued, consumers, sales are going up. People are mm -hmm. drinking a lot of Canadian whiskey and it's not just mixing it with soda and ginger ale anymore. Like they're actually embracing its history, its history in cocktails and uh, wanting to know more about it. And the makers, the producers are putting out much more unique and interesting blends probably than they have during the 80s and 90s. No, absolutely. I mean, it is a great category. And to be a whiskey ambassador, obviously your knowledge has to be intense, in which we're going to talk about that in a little bit, like, you know, some of the education programs and how you've learned about whiskey um, and things that you guys have developed and things you do. Um, I was going to say, um, just a curiosity question. Uh, Nicola, how many countries do you have to visit in a year for your job? Like when I went to visit, just oh. to give a personal story, <laughs> I went to visit Nicola in, in Spain. She was like, I'm going to take the week off. She didn't take the week off. Um, Cause she was like, she's such a workaholic like you are David. And, <laughs> and, and she was like, and you know, she's like, I'm just going to go to Sweden today. So I'll be back this afternoon. Like I'm just going to go in the morning and then I'm going to be back. This afternoon. <laughs> and then tomorrow I'm just, I, I just have to pop up with Paris and then I'll be back. Like, so it's not a big deal. Like we'll totally hang out tonight. I was like, you know how absurd that sounds. But she lives in Spain, um, so which is amazing. So you now, so for all of you that didn't like Nicola is in Spain, in Madrid, and um, you know that's an incredible thing to be able to do. And David, you talked to me yesterday. You said, "How many if you go to Australia and you'll be gone for like a month?" So how many countries in normal times? Uh, yeah, a, lo a lot like of my. Here? I guess when I started almost seven years ago. The first couple of years, all of our brands were strictly just sold in Canada and the U.S. So I didn't have to travel any farther than Los Angeles or or Vancouver, sometimes the Yukon. But now uh, we're we're growing pretty quick. We're in close to, I guess, just over twenty countries. Um, so it's a lot. I'm, I probably break the hundred and twenty flights a year mark. I I stopped counting a while ago, but it's. It's pretty intense and not as much long travel. So if I do go overseas, um, it's a little more like I'll stay for a month or so because it makes more sense than coming back on the weekends to Toronto. Um, my and you, like Nicola, had moments where he fast in London and London Cocktail Week, and then I've had to jet home to do a night in Detroit for Cocktail Week, 
and then zoom right back to do our comment for Lynn in Germany. So wow. those, those times do happen and it's a little intense, but part <laughs> of the that, that is really intense. And, and Nicola, like I know you spend a lot of time in France and you speak French, which yes. is helpful. Nicola, yes. how many languages do you speak? I am fluent in French and English and I'm working on Spanish right now. I have very <laughs> basic German. Don't okay. test me. <laughs> so what, what's interesting is working on all of these languages. I have a stronger understanding more than anything now, which is very helpful when working in all of my markets. So, um, so as far as countries go, when I first arrived in Spain, um, I discovered that I had 14 countries. I was not anticipating that many. And, um, and so it took me by surprise. Um, now, over the last few years, it, it's become less and less as we've expanded our brand ambassador network that I work with ac across Europe, uh, which has helped me a lot. And so, uh, but it is true that sometimes there are weeks where I can bounce to three different countries. Europe is smaller, so that helps a lot. And I'm not bouncing around nearly as many time zones as you are, Dave, um, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that's it. That, that's a lot. Danny, Donnie Ronan is making fun of us saying so many words mispronounced and I love it. Ha, huh. to you, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what words, but it was probably out of my mouth because my Sat Island still comes through no matter how old I am. So <laughs> you can just take that and, and, and go with it. Um, all right, so um, both of you have had some, an interesting career before you became uh, these global brand ambassadors. So. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, I would, Dave, tell me, like, I know you own some bars and some restaurants, but tell me, like, you also are an actor, so expand on that, because I think all that tributes to who you are as a brand ambassador now. Dave's, Dave has a lack of... Aging myself, uh, the decade before I became... Can you guys hear me? So, yeah, yeah, just coming in and out a little um, bit. I guess for about a decade, I owned and operated a few different bars and restaurants in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And um, probably for two decades, I worked behind the bar. That's when I had them as well. And yeah, almost 20 years worked behind a bar, owned and operated. Before that, I worked for a little bit, which a lot of people kind of find funny, but that's, uh, I guess I've always been on stage. So this, this career makes sense as well. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'm, unfortunately, uh, Dave, your mic is cutting in and out, but yeah, I, I know like Dave uh, owned and operated many bars and we're going to talk about how you expanded from there and get how they convince you to become a brand ambassador, which is a pretty big thing. And then, um, and then you also were an actor and then like, did you do anything? It's like, or you've been in the restaurant industry for how long, Dave? Yeah. He's cutting out. Come on, Dave. Best. Come on, Dave. Oh, he's coming back. All right. That's all right. Technology in, in, in 2021, it always, it, it, you never know where it's going to go. You fix your technology. I, I will talk to Nicola while you're coming in and out. So Nicola, you have yes. definitely had a varied career. Um, yeah. so you. I mean, I met you at MKTG. I, mm -hmm. I've known you for the circus you've done. So you've had a couple of different careers um, that have led you up to. So just kind of like name some of the companies you've worked for and like what your role was. Sure. So I've all, I am a person who has always followed her heart and that has led me down a, a number to an opportunity to work with a number of different great companies. As you mentioned, I too started off as an actor and worked as an actor professionally for about 20 years and, uh, and loved it. And then I, uh, I crossed over into marketing because I liked the, Honestly, the balance between um, both uh, creative and business. And mm -hmm. uh, that started off, I started off my marketing career working for Porsche on the front end of things. Uh, so in the automotive industry, I worked for Porsche as a vehicle specialist and um, doing special events for them. They were searching for someone who was fluent in French and English and could work in both Canada and the United States. And I uh, little did I know that it would really kind of set 
the the bar my my rhythm for the career ahead in marketing because um, working for Porsche, uh, I studied the engineering of the vehicles. I studied the technology and physics of racing. And I went into that job not knowing a single thing about cars. And then next thing I knew, I was working with Le Mans race car drivers, uh, both on and off the track. And because of the attention to detail with Porsche and because of the um, really just the, the, the technology and the constant innovation in the automotive industry and the specificity of, of building a, a car like that, uh, um, it kind of, uh, I think because I worked with such a unique product like that, it set the bar so high for me that anything that I worked with after that, I had to give that same amount of attention to detail, and which I, which I did. And, and a couple of years later, that's when I started to do work with MKTG, working on their whiskey portfolio and uh, reserve brands. And that was my- you don't know, MKTG is the agency uh, that I worked with they worked exclusively with Diageo. So when Nicholas says their whiskey portfolio, we're talking about Diageo like uh, Johnny Walker. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And my first experience in whiskey was with Johnny Walker. And the thing that really drew, it was the thing that, that sparked me into whiskey and my passion for it and falling in love with it um, as a result. And for that, the, the reason that I was first drawn into it was because of, I, I'm a Canadian with Scottish heritage, and Dave knows this. I mean, in New York City, there's there. I didn't find a lot of things with regards to Scotland and the Scots, and whereas in Canada, anyone who's Scot Scottish Canadian, you know, wears their kilts and you know, plays their bagpipes at any opportunity. And so, when I suddenly started to do this work in whiskey, I was drawn into the history and the heritage because of my family history. And it sparked my my interest and and it made me think of home. And then it was I'm just gonna stop with the kilt yeah. thing because Dave I know is a double denim kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> right, Dave? You're all about your double denim. Uh-oh. It works. It's when it came and found me. It, it totally works. I, I I love it. Hey, you inspired a culture. People show up to trade shows dust dress in double denim to drink some Canadian whiskey, which is amazing. You've inspired a trend. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, the one thing you two both have in common is your acting careers. So, like, do you find? And I've actually found I, I, a lot a of small part to play. A small part to play. What's that? Dave's connection keeps cutting in and out. No, Dave, come on. Come on, Dave, come on back. You're there, there you I'm are, Dave. To fix this. No, no, you're good now, go talk. So Dave, uh, you had a small part to play. So you have, you were an actor as well. Do you, you find that gave you um, comfortability uh, being uh, a brand ambassador? Because I find a lot of Can great brand ambassadors. Were, yes. I, I, I'm having some actors. technical difficulties. Yep, well, you're back now. We can hear you. Dave, can you hear us? Oh. Dave, ah. come back. I know, come back. You're back. Yay. Hi, Dave. <laughs> so, um, so what I was what I was saying was Nicola was talking about like her first entry uh, into whiskey was in Johnny Walker. We were talking about like backgrounds and she worked for Porsche. Um, which was all about the technicality of it. You worked, um, and I know Nicola, you've done many, many things, which I've always admired. You follow your heart and you kind of set a goal and, and go for it. And, and Dave, you also mentioned to me yesterday when we were talking that you, and you, you were also an actor, you own bars and restaurants, um, which, you know, gives you a, a unique insights into the industry and how it works. But also I just always find it intriguing that being an actor, uh, how that helps being a brand ambassador. Dave? I think so. It's used to, uh, yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Can you? Okay. I, good. Can hear you. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're, you're essentially, you're, you're always, you're always on stage. You have to always be on, you're always smiling. Um, you know, uh, 
physically you're on stage and a lot of the times you're just always in front of a crowd and you have to use that on camera when uh the connection's working better you're just always <laughs> presenting to people so i think having that kind of training certainly helped me uh even when it came to being a bartender i was behind the bar five nights a week for almost 20 years so you're always need to be on you have to be smiling you have to be entertained well engaged and that's find the connection between uh and brand ambassadors no absolutely and, 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 and did you find so nicola you were also and I'm, I'm assuming you feel the same way so for you uh and dave i'll start with you and then nicola i'll talk to you it's like I know, but you still like when it became uh, presenting to uh, TV or doing the press. Um, did the did Perno give you have you go through extra training for that as well? You just I just lost you there. Um, I think asked about training. Uh, I originally did go in when I started with the company. Uh, they uh set me up with people to train but luckily they felt that um i was equipped to go out on the road right away um and have much full training with corby or no regard but i had done much you. training for years before camera training live okay. stage Pardon me. So for TV, did you? I, we were talking about yesterday that you they did definitely take you through like okay, uh, yeah. a more intense, a more intense training for camera. For you were comfortable in front of the camera, but you needed to go through a special training for press. Oh yeah. But was that really helpful? Yeah, you know, cam cam camera work certainly certainly a little bit of press. You know, you have to uh, be authentic, but you need to speak properly to the brands, the category. So it's just fine tuning, I guess. It's a little rough around the edges, always fine tuned. No, absolutely. Because there are definitely some things that um, Nicola, I'm sure you can test, like sometimes they can catch you up. Like the press is, I love the press, but sometimes there are certain press that are not always your friend. Um, and, you know, they might ask you questions because they're curious about certain things and they try to get you to say things that you probably shouldn't say. Um, I, I, I definitely was learned to, uh, got received press training. So I didn't say any of those things. Nicola, did you get press training as well? Media training? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And I find it incredibly helpful just in terms of, um, uh, how to, how to manage everything, how to manage questions and how to, and, you know, I think many people have said this before, but, you know, if you don't know the answer, don't. Don't don't try to answer it. Say I can get back to you on something. It's okay. We don't have all of the answers, and and it's all right to be very direct with anyone in any situation um, to be able to answer the questions properly. Right? We're we're human, so uh, I think that media training is essential um, and a very important aspect as a brand ambassador. No, I think that's great words of advice. Like if you don't know to answer, don't make it up. No. Uh, Dave, you had a great story yesterday. You told me about like you, somebody asked you a question, you were in a master class, and, and you had a great solution to, you couldn't answer a question. Can you tell that story? Oh, yes. That would have been um, at Inter Whiskey in Frankfurt. I remember it's um, a pretty impressive group of people like uh, Whiskey Con stores and, and you know whiskey whiskey fanatics whiskey geeks people who know a lot about whiskey and again canadian whiskey in germany is pretty unknown so anyone when you're having a presentation a master class you're on stage there's been a pretty solid turnout of whiskey writers spirit writers just fans of whiskey to learn about the category and i've always had a rule since day one if I get something with a tactical question, I'm not going to pretend. I'll usually give you my card and say, let me find out. I'll write you back tonight. But this particular class, there was, I can't even remember what the question was. 
someone wanted to know something that was so over my head. I said, listen, timing in Canada right now, our mass one doctor, Don Livermore, should be awake. And I stood there in the class and I texted Don and he got back to me right away. But he was actually <laughs> impressed. The question and the audience just loved that we had the master blender at the ready. Uh, so that was kind of I've always followed that rule. I'll I'll text him, send an email right away. If luckily at this point, I'm not stumped very often. But you know, it happens. It definitely happens. and it is impressive, like that you're at the finger, like that you have that relationship with the distiller because not every brand ambassador has that connection with their distillers. I mean, when I worked for Diageo, they were definitely wanted like Enrique, Enrique de Colsa from Don Julio, like I could, I could call him, uh, uh, you know, that was probably, and Tom Nichols when he worked for Tanqueray, like there's definitely a few distillers where I got to, uh, where I was able to get to know them. And I think that helps a brand ambassador establish credibility. So I think it's important for brands uh, to make sure that they, their brand ambassadors are introduced to their master distillers if they have one, and there is that communication and relationship um, because like you said, sometimes it just, you might be stumped. You might need that information and also just be able to ask that direct question because the marketing team's not going to be able to tell you because they don't know, you know, they, they could tell you like what the marketing plan is or the budget is, but they're not going to be able to answer that very specific question for the most part. Um, I have met some brand, uh, brand marketing managers that are pretty uh, brand managers that are pretty impressive. Um, that know their stuff inside and out and have spent a lot of time with the master distillers. All right. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about social media. So all of us are a certain age. And let's say I think I'm older than all of you. Um, so social media is not something that you all of us were brought up with. Right. So but it's something we've all had to learn to adapt to and something that we've all had to, you know, uh, get get good at because it's just part of our world uh, making me sound self self sounds very old. Um, but, um, you know, you both have, you know, really acquired a large following um, in your, in your time. Um, I'm assuming you've picked up some, you know, we might not be masters, but there's some tricks of the trade. Like uh, Dave, uh, Nicola, I was telling Dave yesterday that you and I went on a trip to Vietnam mm -hmm. and I was because you had like you know your tripod and a bottle of Macallan and like you know, you're like oh yeah I carry this with me all the time so tell me some of your tricks of the trade and things that you do because you definitely have a platform of like health and wellness and whiskey and you know it's a lot about you but you know tell me some of the things that you do to well, what you've done to get your uh, establish your social media and to keep um, in contact with everybody. Dave, do you want to kick it off? Or you want me to kick it off on this one? I'm giving it to you to start. Right. Okay, I'll <laughs> kick it off. Um, so for me, I think that um, uh, the opportunity um, can come up at any time. And so always be ready for it, watching for it and whatnot when it comes to capturing that moment, taking that photo and whatnot. Uh, so to, to develop your, your awareness to um, to uh, to what you want to share, whether it be that new cocktail, whether it be again that you're on a boat uh, floating, you know, in Vietnam, and and you have that bottle of Macallan, and you capture that moment that's such a unique uh, unique uh, experience, uh, and to be able to share that, I, I you know, as a brand ambassador storytelling is enormous. And uh, with social media, it's also about telling that story. And through that, you have to understand your brand's messaging and how we are bringing the, the, the liquid forward, but also be, I don't like to use the word authenticity, I'll be authentic, right? Because it gets thrown around a lot, but it's very true to be yourself, to always be yourself and understand and own that, that it's still, it's your voice and that the brand team trusts, you know, trusts you to be able to bring forward the brand through and all of the messaging and, and the education, but through your voice and have that still resonate through your social media. And yeah. so well, I think it's just guidelines. really- Do you have guidelines mm -hmm. that they give you of what they want to see, like, or things you want to say? 
Absolutely. I think that I think that and I, I would hope that every business, you know, has social media guidelines and uh, just in terms of do's and don'ts and and how to approach things properly and even tips on photography and whatnot. Just like media training, this is something that you can continue to learn and develop as a skill uh, right down from different apps that you can use, how to plan your social media calendar and whatnot. And that's an area where I feel I'm still learning every day. You know, what's that balance between posts and between um, uh, how you how how you want to, to what part of the story you want to focus on, where you are, and um, and how you, how your brand comes to life in that uh, wherever you are in the world at that time too. So all of those things are are things to consider and plan. No, absolutely. So we were talking about this yesterday. I was talking, but like, do you do carry around like this is one of the like, tips of the trade? I think everybody can learn from Nicola in this way is that she does carry around all the time like a tripod and a mini bottle of Macallan, like no matter where <laughs> she is. So that way, if she has a moment to take an impromptu picture, and I think that was genius. It was like you just always have a mini bottle in your bag so that you can take a photo um or a large bottles no matter where you are and because you never know the moment right you never you never know when the moment's going to inspire you and i was talking to dave yesterday about a social media calendar because it was something i learned i took a social media strategy class at the beginning of this year before COVID hit i was already planning i was like this is my year of education and a social media strategy i knew was really important i'm still not amazing at but i at least i know what i'm supposed to be doing i just have to find that time to actually do it and creating a content calendar would be amazing, like planning out your like what you're going to post every single day and taking lots of photos and then you can like spread them out. Um, Dave, you and I were talking about it. You're like, yeah, I don't have that organization, but your your photos on your page are amazing. Um, so tell us about you have like a photographer I know you work with a lot. Yeah, I am. Um... I'm not going to pretend uh, to know much about social media trends. Uh, I guess I've always felt it like life, just uh, having credibility, authenticity, trust uh, will help you gain a little bit of an audience. Um, mm -hmm. I've been fortunate as well where working with the brand teams, um, I take care of a lot of the social media content. And with that, you know, we create Thoughts. We create life uh, If I'm out with a the photographer, they're shooting me and the bottles, me and cocktails. We work with uh, a few different teams outside of Canada as well to do. So I'm uh, fortunate, privileged to have all the events. And where I might not have a try with like Nicola, I do try to dabble and and do a little bit of photography as well. So I try to keep uh, my page on Instagram, for instance, pretty consistent, you know, whether it's, there's not much of my personal life on there anymore. It's all about the job. So it's about cocktails, where you're traveling, the people you're meeting, their creations, your ways, distillery tours. It kind of stays in those four or five things. So if you enjoy that type mm -hmm. of thing, I think uh, that's on key followers. If you don't like that, they're probably going to leave those somewhere else. No, I think that's important. Having a theme is definitely important. So having three or four things that people know what to expect from your page is really important. If you want to do, if you're a brand ambassador and you want to put your personal stuff on there, like every once in a while, I'll throw a personal photo, like, you know, of my family or, you know, myself and, and Philip, but people, Philip's in the industry as well. So um you know so i put it up there but you know i try not to you know it is important to have a theme so people know what to expect and you know they do recommend if you're going to have if you want personal like for your family then create an entire different page um one thing i definitely learned this year was like i, used, I had like three or four accounts like one was for like ready to drinks and and hard seltzers and one was doing like you know, impromptu cocktails, like when I was out on accounts and I really, I just consolidated them all down to one because it's too much. And mm -hmm. it's like just concentrating on one uh, streamlines your life, which I think we all could use streamlining in our lives, especially when you're, you know, a global brand ambassador and you have so many countries and things to worry about. Um, 
So, yeah, and I, I love the fact that, you know, you also had a professional photographer, Dave, that you talked to me that uses you as a muse, which is why you have all these great photos of you on your page. <laughs> I like <Wow>. that. <laughs> he does. There's a professional photographer, right? That yeah, your company ridiculous. works with. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> but it works. I mean, it's even... It's, it's one thing that a small bit of training I've had with social media is, I guess a lot of people follow, follow accounts for different reasons. And I think a lot of people that might follow my account certainly want to know about cocktails or whiskey, but I think it's more of the journey that we're on. And I mean, for the last year, I haven't been much, much of a journey except in my apartment, but generally it's a pretty, I think, interesting, whether it's, you know, romantic glamour shots of, if you're in Paris or Berlin, or if you're curious, if you're stuck in an airport for two days because of a snowstorm and you're getting through your pile of expenses and your Instagram, I mean, that's actually <laughs> your real life as an ambassador, where it's not always glamorous as we present it on social media, showing some of the realities I think people appreciate. No, I think that's. I think that's a huge thing. And, and Dave and I talked about Nicola, and I don't know if you've experienced it, but, you know, it was really hard in the beginning, you know, when I started becoming a brand ambassador, it was like 2007. And, you know, I was definitely older than most of the brand ambassadors mm -hmm. out there. And I got to do some really cool shit, like very soon, which was like being on Bar Rescue and being on What's What Happens Live. And I got to do a lot of TV and Pottery Barn. I was in Hawaii one day and I was, you know, in this set one day. And I didn't really talk about it that much because I was embarrassed. I didn't want to show off. It was like, all right, this is my life. And like, it's, 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 I, I, I'm excited. I think it's kind of cool, but I don't want to be a show off. And for years, I just didn't, I didn't put it out there because I was so afraid people would make fun of me. They'd be like, oh, who does she think she is? Um, and Dave talked about it a little bit too. It's like, it's embarrassing at first. It's like, and then you realize, you know, the younger generation started coming up. They're like, fuck that. <laughs> Look at all the cool shit I'm doing. This is amazing. <laughs> and it might've just been me. And I'm like, oh, damn, I should have capitalized that a, a little bit more. And now I talk about it in a personal brand seminar. I'm like, fuck the industry. Fuck what people think. Just put it out there. You know, don't be an asshole, but like, you know, just, Hey, this is the cool stuff because people want to see that. And most people want to celebrate you. If you're doing well, good people want to celebrate your success. Do you find that to be true? Do people want to celebrate your success? Okay. I think in our in I, I think in our industry, I think that um, I think that uh, the hospitality industry uh, embraces um, one another's successes, which I think is. Uh, which I think is a positive in our industry. It's a really supportive industry. And so um, we enjoy celebrating not just the brand ambassadors, but the bartenders and the, and the bar owners and the restaurant owners and the chefs and everyone involved. And I think that it's a, I think it's one of the things that I love is that uh, uh, that kind of support, that kind of uh, positive energy and, and, um, and that kind of, uh, yeah, that kind of community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Dave, I know it was hard for you in the beginning, but you find most people are very receptive to you being a brand ambassador and traveling around the world. Yeah, sorry, Mike. That's okay. I know you're on a lag. I think you were asking if people are receptive to it. It's actually, it's a great question because one thing for myself, like 20 years of working behind the bar and operating bars and restaurants, you know, most of my friends over those couple decades still do own and operate bars and restaurants. Like most of my friends do. Uh, and I am viewed in a little bit of a different light. Like they see you more of going to the corporate side. I think and, and um, one thing that saved me, for instance, Lot 40 was something that I'd used at all my restaurants for years. So this was just a step. Um, 
as I've said times, I probably wouldn't have stayed in the barn restaurant industry that much longer or anyway, because I'm a hands-on operator who's there 18 hours a day. And that gets hard as you get older. So this to me became a natural evolution to what I do because I still get to educate, I still get to entertain people. I'm working with brands that I truly love and had used for years uh, before I worked for the brand. And you get to travel and, and meet some of the greatest people in the world who are operating and working at some of the greatest bars and restaurants around the globe mm -hmm. as well. So it's for me, that's the job. The job is the reward, the job reward. Yep. No, it, it is an incredible role. When you when you do get to that, that is the glamour part of it. And obviously, and we'll talk about a little bit of the grunge of it, like what we have to do. And we'll, we'll give a quick shout out to all the brands we're working for right now. So I'm going to go like, this is Kapali, you know, uh, from Belize, only made with three ingredients. <laughs> Sugar cane, water, and yeast. So Ooh, there you go. There. there you go. What do you got there? Lot 40? There's a little McAllen. All right. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. uh, thank you all for these amazing companies right. that give us. I'll give a shout out to this. What, Dave? Um, Something right. new. Mm -hmm. Dave's finding his thing. So, all right. So, Nicola. Sorry, I think yeah. my uh, feed's long. I yeah, <laughs> it gets a little delayed, but yeah. it's okay. But Nicola, you did something really interesting, which I really respect because I've done some similar things, but you really took, you went to a whole nother country to do it. Um, you, when you decided you want to become a whiskey ambassador, before you even had the job, you took a trip to Scotland. So tell us a little about that. I did. I, um, well, with whiskey being my passion, I figured, you know, uh, I need to get over to Scotland and, and study. I need to get over there and experience. And, um, and so I made the decision as I was continuing to work with all of my freelance clients in marketing, continuing to work in spirits, continuing my education back in New York City um, in the cocktail world and, and starting to um, study as much as possible um, in New York, I decided uh, that I would make a trip over to Scotland for two weeks on my own to go and visit distilleries and start to absorb as much as I possibly could. I remember at the time, a lot of people sort of said to me, well, why don't you wait for a brand to send you? And I thought, why would I wait? Why would I wait for anyone to, you know, make things happen? I think it's, I think it's really important with whatever you do, whatever you're passionate about, don't wait for someone else to make it happen for you. Go out there and do it yourself. And, Absolutely. and, and so that's what I decided. And what the moment that I decided that, what I felt really fortunate about was everyone was there to support me. Um, so many different friends that worked for different brands said, oh my goodness, you're going to Scotland. Okay, where are you going? What's your itinerary? What's your plan? Do you wanna go and visit this distillery? Do you wanna visit that distillery? Do you wanna stay on my couch? Would you like to stay with my parents? They have a spare bedroom. I'm not joking. And it was like everything just opened up and I said, oh my gosh, I am the luckiest human because um, I, I was just, I, I was so driven by my passion and I just followed my heart and said, let's, let's do this, let's make this happen, save up for it and do it. And, and it was like the world opened itself up to me when I made that decision. And I, and you and I were talking about this. I think it's so important that with whatever you're passionate about, when you make that decision to make things happen, um, then, uh, then it's amazing how the universe can support you along the way as well. And I feel, I feel really lucky for that. And so that, that was my first trip over to Scotland. And I've since made so many on my own to go and continue <laughs> studying. And I'm so grateful because at Edrington as well, they know I've spent holidays at our distilleries working and I show up with my steel toes. I show up with my safety vest and I say, hi, I'm here to work. Can I turn <laughs> malt? Can I climb around in the warehouse and understand how uh, samples are pulled? Can I roll casks? Can I learn how to build a cask, which I've had the good fortune to do. And I talk about that all the time. Yeah. I didn't lose any fingers, thank goodness. But you know, I've, I've, I've built casks myself and uh, I'm grateful for those opportunities. And 
and yeah. uh, for just asking the questions. So that's one of the yeah. amazing things about our industry. If you do ask for help, I always say to people, I'm like, if you ask for help, people generally will give it to you. If you say, I would like to know this thing. There are generally somebody out there is like, I, I will help you. I'm like, just ask. I mean, when I wanted to learn about cocktails, uh, because I became the head mixologist for Diageo, had never worked behind a bar. I just decided I wanted to learn about cocktails and I went for it and I took the BAR course and Jim Meehan mentored me and I just started learning about drinks, but I always felt like a fake. And mm -hmm. so uh, I decided, okay, if people keep asking me, well, especially after I went on Bar Rescue, uh, questions, uh, if I'm going to give them questions, I want to make sure they're true and authentic and that they're coming from a place of experience. So I asked bars, like I, I got to intern at the Dead Rabbit, the Nomad, uh, and I asked them, I was like, can I just work behind your bar for free for like, you know, four or five days? uh just so i can learn i'll make the syrups i'll prep i just want to see how you do all your systems everything i want and they were like okay they're like why That's I'm like, amazing because I, I i just want to learn so when i give information it's from the best bars in the world like i'm gonna make sure i'm saying this is what they do and i know because i i worked there for five days i didn't work there but i interned there and they taught me everything they know and and Dave, I know for yourself, you've gotten a chance to actually work with your like master distiller. Like uh, Don has like taken you in, and you get to like really learn from him one on one all the time. Correct? <laughs> we have to give him like a yeah. Break. It's been great. Like I don't have the I don't have the formal education as, as uh, Nicola or Gina. Now, Fawcett, who's our trade education manager in the U.S., um, but I've been fortunate for the last seven years to be working with Dr. Don, who's a microbiologist and has his PhD in brewing and distilling, and along with all the other men and women at Hiram Walker and Sons Distillery, they've been welcoming me with open arms uh, to work alongside and bring a process of making our whiskeys from the time it shows up from the farmers right until we've finished blending and we're putting into the bottles sent out to the world. Uh, it's been an incredible and invaluable experience over the last seven years because of these people. Yeah, and do you feel it makes you a better presenter because you can talk about it through authenticity? Sorry, I missed that last part. I, I, you say, does it feel you it makes you a better, and I'm going to assume you said brand ambassador. Uh, and if that's what you did say, then yes. Answer, yes. Um, <laughs> not right now, because my connection's horrible. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm. Mean, in the last decade, the how consumer uh, mindset has changed. Um, they want to know everything about the food they're eating, the wine they're drinking, the, how the, the beer made, how the spirits are made, how the cocktails. So for no, I have on the category in our brands, the better. And we try to get as detailed as, as we possibly can when it comes to exploring the category of Canadian sea. And not just our brands, but the entire category. Yeah, I was gonna say, and and and, and um, Dave, tell me a little bit about you. Do a program. You created a program for your brands where you bring brand ambassadors. I'm sorry, bartenders to the distillery. You created a visitor center. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was one thing that was fantastic. I started uh, with the company. Um, when I started with the company, uh, right away, uh, one of those things I one had sold their brands for 15 years and i'd never taken that 45 minute flight from toronto to windsor to go see this simply because they weren't really doing that so one thing they, that was amazing for me right away uh, and luckily everybody was aligned in an agreement was, was we started focusing on education first and post canadian whiskey so we were able to build a brand center, which included a bar for trainings, a blending room for our 
or blender dr to work from when we pass to the distillery from around the world and and location works great now when we bring bartenders from over season across the US to Canada, a couple nights in Toronto with us, kind of the city where Canadian whiskey really did start back in the early 1800s. And they had a journey to the distillery, the Canada Whiskey City, Windsor, Ontario, which homes our distillery, which is right across the river from Detroit. We, we can take a taxi from the distillery wow. over to Detroit. And that's kind of one of the main cities in America where Canadian whiskey certainly had an influence on their uh, bar scene back before and during Vogue. Absolutely. No, it definitely did. No, you told me, like, I thought that was really incredible that, you know, you told them, like, hey, you've never taken me to the, your uh, business. You've never taken me to your distillery and I sell your product. And the minute you said they should have one, they built one, um, which I think Love is which is which is incredible it shows your impact and it's just something sometimes people just need to hear it like oh we never thought of that before and would people actually think this is cool um and i think that's one of the biggest influence brand ambassadors have is sometimes brand teams and you got to realize that brand a brand manager sometimes just came out of getting their you know their master's degree from marketing school and they might have worked at campbell soup um, before they came and worked for the, for the brand and they don't drink a lot. Sometimes they don't drink at all. Like, and they don't go to bars. So, you know, they, they think of the brand as a business rather than like, we think of it as a passion and the connection between people. So I think the brand ambassador's role, as much as it is connecting us, the brand to uh, the trade and the consumer also sometimes bringing the people who work in corporate into the world into the world of the people who drink it because they don't spend as much time in there. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't, at least uh, from a lot of people I talk to, that seems to be the experience. I mean, Nicola, do you, a lot of your brand team, do they go out in the marketplace? Are they like, um, you know, do you find that a lot of them, they're out drinking McAllen all the time and traveling the world and going to cocktail bars? A lot of them do. And yeah. honestly, what's interesting is is because with my brand managers, I have different brand managers in every single country that I work with. And what I really love is the, really the aspect of collaboration. So them bringing their experience forward, them bringing all of their knowledge also um, from, not just from a, a brand and marketing aspect, but also from understanding their markets and how things work. And then me looking at it from a um, creative brand aspect as well, to really look at the overall global brand vision, what's mm -hmm. happening in the markets and how we can create something really meaningful that will work for that, that region together. And so that's where for me, I think I, I adore that aspect of collaboration. It's not necessarily about me running with an idea and leading. It's really about like, let's pitch these, let's talk about this. And sometimes it might be some ideas that I have and I say, let me draw up a one pager on this and get your thoughts. Um, but quite often, or they might have the idea already and then say, this is what we've got for you, Nicola. And then I'll add in my two cents and we'll talk about it and figure it out. But um, I love, I, I just, I love that creative aspect of working together as a team and, and coming up with solutions that make sense. Um, no, I, again, think, which I think it's great. Do you get, so do you get briefed, like when you're doing your brand planning, when the teams are doing their brand planning, do you br get brought into that? Or are you presented? Yes. The, okay. Which is great. Yes. It's, it's, there's a, there's, there, there are a lot of, again, there's a, there's a lot of different steps in the, in the process. And I, uh, and, and it's really collaborative though, in having those conversations with my team here, with my teams in my markets as well. And, uh, and, then also, yeah, being creative and saying, how can I best support um, what we want to do in every single market? And each market is different as well. And so it, it means that you really have to be flexible. Um, you have to be on your toes with things and have an understanding that every market has their different challenges and their different, um, and their different uh, 
approaches, right? So, right. so um, each plant market might have a specific goal, a specific way they're approaching it. Maybe they're positioning the brand a little bit differently, even though corporate probably has a unifying layer, like the brand should be here, but every market might have different ones. So it's important for you to know that in order for you to be able to help them. Correct. Exactly. Understand what their opportunities are and how they're looking at planning the entire year out. And then how can I support that? How can I add to that? How can um, how can we work together to 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 have a great year? <laughs> so I, I, I really love that teamwork aspect of it, though. And I feel really lucky because um, all of my all of my distribution teams and th that's an extension of my team. I have these yeah. wonderful teams that I work with all across Europe and, and it's, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we do everything together? So no, I, mean, I think it's incredible to be able to I feel collaborate very, with other people. Yeah. I think that's amazing. Yeah. And Dave, I know you collaborate a lot with my, one of my old work colleagues, Gina Castillo. Uh, and uh, she's, she's the real nerd on the whiskey side of things in America. Correct. And you collaborate with her a lot in all your projects. Yeah, moving yeah, actually, um, <clears throat> yeah, we do. So it's, uh, Gina, Gina Fawcett's our, our main ambassador for the U.S. and heads up all the trade and education with us. And we participate in many cocktail weeks um, in the U.S. and Canada every year and a few overseas, probably about 10. Each project is very different from the next. Uh, Mm -hmm. Depending on what makes sense for the brand, that makes sense for us to partake. Uh, you know, it's a lot of planning these things, kind of what we're doing now, virtually, over the phone, email. Uh, and it's not as easy to execute. Uh, if you're doing a large, large activation at San Antonio Cocktail Conference or Portland Cocktail Week or um, to not be there to see the setup can be challenging to work with um, literally bartenders uh, we know from those markets will hire on to help us get things organized and you know activate them. We'll work with companies like Hospitality 201 out of Chicago who will create cocktails for us and really help us better uh, the whole experience want to be there hands on. I might have a meeting from somewhere else around the world with them and then the trust we have that make things happen is incredible and of course working our orders and their teams and distributors who also help us put everything together it's it's a big effort yeah uh, no, absolutely. Everybody to collaborate and, uh, put these, uh, things together I do you want to talk a little bit about some of the th the project you and gina are working on right now or no Yeah, we're um, like everybody else. Last March, when this uh, when we got locked down around the world, we had to, you know, evolve and change. And I don't want to say the word pivot, but you know, like everyone else, we had to <laughs> on some of our strategies. And everything became online, and it, it gave us some time to focus on things like drink strategies for each brand that we have you know things for the sales teams problems i've seen arise over the years in every different market we're in little things to fix tiny things like that but one thing we really started focusing on she's in agreement with me that canadian whiskey really is the world's most misunderstood category so for the last almost year now we've been building a course a one month or five week course that we're looking to certified uh, on Canadian whiskey and uh, it's coming together nicely. I might, I shouldn't be saying too much more, but you know, it's gone through ups and we're uh, hopefully looking to release it to the world in this year and pretty excited with what we put together and Dean decided to give her credit majority of the work uh, with me working alongside of her, but it is a, it's a beautiful thing, and I think it's about time uh, the category of Canadian whiskey. No, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's awesome. excited to share everyone soon. We will be excited to share it with everyone soon. 
<laughs> no, I think that's incredible. And, and congratulations. I know how it works. work as somebody who's, who's putting together an online training academy for brand ambassadors themselves. It's a lot of work. So it's a lot of work writing and filming. And um, so I'm excited to see the Canadian uh, whiskey uh, version. I think it'll be very, very cool because I think it'll be eye-opening to many, many people. I've, I've experienced uh, going through a presentation you did. Uh, you came to the liquor lab and presented Canadian whiskey. And I, I learned a ton, like just about like what's allowed to be added, what's, you know, not, and like just some of the rumors. So I think it's, you know, an interesting category. And there's so much history between U.S. and Canada and, you know, during prohibition and things of that nature when it comes to can Canadian whiskey. So that is very exciting. So when do you think it's going to come out? Absolutely. He didn't hear my question. That's okay. <laughs> Nicola, so uh, Nicola, I, you also, you do, it's okay. I was asking you when you think it would come out. Nope. <laughs> I'd say um, you'll probably get to see it in this year. Okay, cool. All right. There um, you go. He got it. Um, so Nicola, you have taken, you're somebody who, you know, really follows your passions you know, you set a goal and you, you, then not all of them are within whiskey itself. So you have taken other courses outside of whiskey. Um, so tell me some of the courses you have taken and why you thought they were important to expand your knowledge and help you be a better brand ambassador. Sure. Okay. So um, I'm a great believer in, and I know everyone here is as well in, in shared learning as we've talked about and continued learning as well right? Peer-to-peer -peer learning and then and then just continuing to expand our knowledge, both in the spirits and outside of the spirits industry, outside of the F&B industry. And I think that you can often draw inspiration from learning other things. It always seems to, for me, it always comes back to whiskey. So within whiskey, um, I did my general certificate in distillation through the Institute for Brewing and Distilling, which was an incredible experience. Um, anyone who wants to do a deep dive into distillation, I highly recommend it. Um, whatever spirit you are looking to study, to understand that full process and, and look at the engineering and all of the inner workings of distilleries, it's uh, really, really fantastic. Um, outside of spirits, though, um, I, you know, I'm just, I'm flavor obsessed <laughs> and aroma obsessed. We've always got our noses in a whiskey glass and we're always talking about what do you smell? What do you taste? How do you feel? That process of discovery and whatnot. And that has driven me to study different things that have, um, you know, sometimes following my nose and other times just following uh, my curiosities. And so I, uh, within the last couple of years, I, I became an olive oil sommelier. I live in Spain. Um, we are, are actually the yeah the number one olive oil producer in the world and uh, highest uh, in volume and whatnot. And so uh, it was incredible for me to go and study olive oil and to go through that sensory process, but with something completely different. And uh, and also the production process when you when you whether you're looking at you know. Uh, whether you're looking at olive oil, whether you're looking at wine, whether you're looking at spirits, everything is food production, right? It's a process and, and what raw materials are you dealing with? What kind of process does it go through? How is it different in that particular place? What makes it unique? And how at the end of the day, do you end up making a beautiful liquid at the end of that, right? Um, so mm -hmm. olive oil just changed my my approach to flavor and aroma and um and it's such a it's such an incredible liquid um i've studied i studied perfume um which was also another i studied perfume in both paris and in london um again exploring aromatics and how we process flavors and aromas and i feel like that again um just pushed me outside of my comfort zone um in terms of uh how i understood aromas, how I processed them, how I identified them. And, um, and also when you think about whiskey, uh, the process of blending as well and the art and science of, mm -hmm. uh, of combining liquids together. Um, I studied, I became a certified sherry educator through the Consejo Regulador de los Vinos de Jerez, 
um, because of I whiskey. I would never be able to say that in a million years, <laughs> the, the words um, would not be able to come out of my mouth and the phonetics. <laughs> <laughs> but we talk about sherry casks all of the time in the whiskey industry. At the Macallan in particular, we're always talking about the importance of our sherry seasoned casks. And so I wanted to take that to a new, a new level of exploration in understanding the process of, uh, of, of winemaking, of making sherry wines and what makes them unique and how they contribute, how they play into flavor and what's unique in that category. And uh, I mean, I just, I find um, inspiration comes through pushing, you know, following those curiosities and pushing yourself, making yourself uncomfortable, exploring things that you wouldn't necessarily, that don't always necessarily directly align with what you're doing. And, and somehow it always, it comes back. I, I was telling you the other day that uh, art is one of those things that I found as I travel, if I have a free moment, I always go to an art gallery. I love going to different art galleries and museums and just getting lost in the colors, getting lost in, in the paintings and everything around me and finding what inspires me. And through studying art, it comes back to whiskey because it, it's that, <laughs> it, it, it's the, the, those layers of all of the but I love it. Of aromas, flavors, colors, uh, textures, how they all come together. And I just, uh, I encourage people to always think outside of the box and and see how it inspires inspires you how it how it makes you think differently and makes you approach your spirit how you approach your brand differently. I think that no, I definitely um, think that outside resources and and Dave, I'm sure you could agree as a man with a multi level of plaid shirts. Um, I'm just teasing you. Did he hear me? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Here he's smiling. He just <laughs> on a delay um because dave and i were make fun of each other like you know about uh technology and, and expanding you know things that you know learning new new skill sets and also expanding you know the knowledge that you have because it does give you new insight into what you're what you're looking at and how you approach it and if you do learn about sherry or olive oil or Spain, like that does open your brain, like just to look at things in a different way, including art. You know, I can never go to an art gallery for more than an hour. I, I, like an hour. <laughs> I call it speed art. I go to the things I want to see and then I'm out. Like I pick out like there's four artists. I'm like, those are the artists and I'm out, out of the museum. Um, but Dave, Dave and I were talking about the also the other day, like some of the skill sets, like when you come on to be a brand ambassador and depending on what your background is, there's some things you might you might not know how to do in your old life because you didn't work in corporate. And Dave, you expanded on, there's some things you definitely had to learn from the beginning. Because I think this is common to a lot of people. So I think people feel comfort that, that you also had to learn these things. Absolutely. We like say <clears throat> almost 20 years before this role, um, I, I operated bars and restaurants, so it was more uh, hands-on, face-to-face dealings with with uh, people, with your customer, your clientele, your guests, with sales reps, distributors, brand ambassadors. Uh, it was all face-to-face. -face. Anything that I had to do work wise on a computer, it was spreadsheets for inventory or you create a menu to send off to a printer that was pretty much it so when i started up with the company you know one of the first things someone asked like okay because you have to remember i didn't really go through an interview process because they asked me to come work for them so they didn't know what my level of and i'm going to ask you about that, that asked me to deck. Like, what do you mean the deck attached to the building and I, <laughs> no, I never opened a PowerPoint in my life. So I had to bring on some tactical skills a little bit for this role. Um, but yeah, it's, I love learning new things. So it was, yeah, it was a, that was, that was something uh, difficult for myself to become a little more tech savvy. Yeah. 
No, I think that's a big one for a lot of people. I mean, I have hired brand ambassadors when I've consulted for companies and they didn't own a computer. And I'm like, you don't own a computer? Like, you know, like, and I meet people. So I always say, I'm like, if there's one investment, like buy yourself a computer, um, cause they would have like an iPad and, you know, a keyboard and, and whatever else. Like, no, you're going to need a computer. Like it makes your life a lot easier and go on YouTube and, and take a PowerPoint class, like learn how to do PowerPoint, like create, create a deck, like just, and it's only useful. If you take the class, it doesn't really help unless you have something to apply it to. So I was like, write a presentation on something you really care about. It could be coffee, could be your gecko. Whatever it is, like follow the class and write something that you're really passionate about. I hate writing PowerPoint decks. I was telling Dave yesterday, it's like when I worked for Anheuser-Busch, when I came there, my PowerPoint skills were like, they were okay. And then suddenly I had to write like literally three, sometimes three decks a day. Like I was constantly, and now my stipulation for Anheuser-Busch is now my client. I, I, I refuse to write them decks. I'm like, nope. I, I will write you a word document all day. I'm like, if you write, make me write you a deck, I'm going to charge you a thousand hours for that deck because it's just <laughs> not worth it. I just, I think it's a waste of time. Um, and by the way, and I told Dave this yesterday, there's a great website called Fiverr where you can hire people. Um, they work in different countries all around the world. They're freelancers. And if you want a deck to look pretty, just hire somebody from Fiverr. It costs you like 30 bucks and you can get your entire deck done. It's amazing. You send them the information, the photos, they'll make it look great. Um, something I've learned and I now use often. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I outsource a lot of that stuff. And Dave, I wanted to go back because we didn't have a chance to talk about this. And I know we're, we're at 311. So I'm going to ask this one last question because I think you should tell your story. You got to design your own role. Like they, they came to you and they they... It, this is something really cool. And only because Dave's connection is shitty, I want to say it for this one part for him. Um, you know, Bruno came to him and, and, and said, hey, we, we want you to represent our brands. And, and you know, and Dave was like, why? And he's like, we just want you to make Canadian whiskey cool. Like you've made Dave Mitten cool, uh, which I know versus Dave, but like Dave is cool. Um, and so Dave he made Canadian cool. whiskey cool. Dave is cool. But you got to design your own job. And I would love you to tell, like, what were the parameters of what you asked for when you designed your own job? And clarify well, I said it, if I said it wrong. It great setup on your part. <laughs> no, it was, it, that, was, that, was, that was perfectly said. I, got, I was approached. At the time, the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing would be working for a brand. I mean, brands used to hide to make cocktails. I never thought I'd really live, leave the bar and restaurant industry at that point. And especially where I was only operating a few. Um, but they presented an opportunity that intrigued me and my two business partners thought it was a great chance uh, for me. And essentially when they asked if I wanted to take on the role, I wondered why, and you know, it came down to the three things that I was more concerned about. They had been thinking about well. One was image, and at that point, I was used to watching, you know, you'd see your gin and vodka and bass, wearing suits and bow ties and doing perfectly stirred elegant martinis, and you'd see your Scotch ambassadors and people coming full dressed in the garb of kilts, and you know, it's. Being a brand ambassador is almost like being an actor on stage. You really have to take on the brand or the category you work for. Mm -hmm. Like if you see a JIT ambassador that might be donning that boat suit, move on to being an American whiskey ambassador, and they take on the fedora and the more rugged jeans and boots look, uh, it, you really have to become what you sell. I was concerned they would want me to change my image and maybe wear more of a suit and tie. But luckily, they were coming after me because of my ability to <laughs> support triple denim. You know, the beard and little hair and the boots and just my whole look was what they were after. So that was great. I didn't have to change my persona. Um, I was concerned in the beginning about integrity and honesty around the category. Uh, and that was not a problem. They have been amazing. We've been, we've become more open about the category in our brands and I've ever so it's fantastic. Buddy from Master Blender 
to brand teams or board, we really do try to educate. And all that, the third thing was, was already, I really want to educate people on the category, on new people. And like you say, they couldn't have been more behind us. They built a brand right away and started a distillery tours and let me build a manual, Gina and I manual and just things we've been doing. They've been supporting us 100%. So I have to give credit. That's amazing. To the, sit behind it and they told me with you seven years ago, they've just grown and gotten better. No, I think you made some oh good God. points. Like you, you do have to embrace the brand, whatever brand that you're working in. It's like, it's got to fit you. So it's like, if that brand is really quirky and you're not a quirky person, like that's not the right fit. Or if you're, it's a place where you have to live your life in dive, uh, dive bars and you're a person who is more comfortable in the plaza, that is not your that's not your brand. Like you really do have to live the life of the brand. So the fact that, you know, they allowed, you know, your double denim and your, and your plaid shirts and your jean, like that's your look. And that was something that you stood up for. And I think it also says a lot about you as a person. You obviously have developed a very good brand reputation that they came to you and said, what do you want? Um, and you stood up for yourself and said, this is the things I need. Um, and it is nice to be in a position where you're like, well, I have bars. Um, I don't need this job. And it's always the best way. By the way, I always tell people, go for jobs that you don't really want just to practice that. Because you're the, never the better negotiator is when you're in an in a interview in a job you don't want. You ask for everything. And then remind yourself when you're in the position to interview for a job you really want <laughs> to ask for the things that you're like, nope, these are the things I need. Um, because you forget sometimes, especially as girls, we cave a little. Um, a lot of women, that's uh, we have a bad reputation of caving sometimes and not asking for what we what we need. Um, uh, or like could just be projecting, but that's, I know that for myself. Um, so I think that's really, really cool. And, and you now represent Canada. Like people think Canadian whiskey, they think of Dave Mitten, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Dave. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're going to be on a flag somewhere. It's just Dave. All right. It's like 316. Uh, so we've gone around. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish with one last question. So, and it was more, and, and you can say you don't have the answer to this, but it was more about you travel around in normal times, you travel around the world. Uh, you have to, you have a personal life and you're traveling all the time. Um, and Dave, I know your answer to this question might be, you might be like, I don't have an answer, but I'm not going to answer for you. So how do you try to keep balance? Like, cause it's a hard job to maintain when you're on the road all the time. So Nicola, how, how do you try to maintain balance in your life? Cause it's important. Well, work-life balance is obviously, I mean, always, always tough with all the travel, as you mentioned and, uh, and, and the hours and whatnot and everything changing. Um, for me, um, I think it's really important to be very clear on what your objectives are when you are going anywhere, when you're working on anything, be very clear with your team what your objectives are, what you're going in as a team to do, and also what and, and also setting boundaries, um, personal boundaries for yourself in terms of, you know, getting enough sleep, make that promise to yourself. Uh, it, it's very easy to be like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll stay out later. Next thing you know, two hours later, you're still out and and uh, and your sleep is ruined for the week, right? So be clear with your own objectives and boundaries and how you manage yourself, right? And so um, with things like proper sleep, exercise, for me, balance is, um, I need that exercise in my life. Um, many of you know that I, you know, I, I often run half marathons. Now my whole thing has been Peloton. I'm on the bike and whatnot. And my sister-in-law just got me started on this crazy Brazilian hit workout. And I feel better when, you know, when I have that balance um, and when I'm able to go and sweat and when I'm able to, you know, shake off jet lag and travel lag and everything when, because of uh, my, my exercise routine, my sleep routine, my family routine. You know, connecting with those who are uh, who I love and who are important to me and making time for them as well and ensuring that, again, 
that I know when I start, when I stop, when I can call, when I can connect to bring that balance in. And it's just, for me, I schedule everything. Everything is on my phone. I say, if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. And I am one of those people that schedules in my own lunch, you know, or it, or my own break in the day and everything just so that I, I don't forget about that balance. So, mm -hmm. you know, because it's very easy, even working from home, as anyone knows, to sit in front of the computer and suddenly be like six hours went by and I've had three cups of coffee and no food. And yeah. that's not balance. So schedule in your breaks ensure that you know you have a lunch break that you have that moment to you know jump on the bike or go for a walk or meditate for 10 minutes whatever it is for you it's really essential to have to have those elements that bring you your your balance your happiness and that is what fuels at the end of the day for me my creativity my energy my focus that i can bring forward in in every single presentation that I'm doing, in every single event that I'm executing, in uh, everything that I'm doing with my team. So, uh, so that it's just, it's no, just that, essential. That, that's, that's great advice. Cause, and, and I'm a schedule person. I schedule in everything. I schedule in my, in my entire day and my week because it allows me to be more productive. Um, all right, Dave, so for you, how do you try to stay balanced? <clears throat> It's certainly not easy and it's, it's not far off from Nicola. I mean, as far as doing, setting a daily schedule for myself, that's difficult in the sense that, you know, where I travel, we're not in a pandemic most weeks. So most people want you in market or in their city, in your town, Monday mornings, which means Sunday afternoons, you're headed to the airport to land in a city, get set up in a hotel so you could be somewhere on time Monday morning. Mm -hmm. They want you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday generally. And you have to set boundaries because it's a compliment that people want you around so much, but sometimes they want you from eight or nine in the morning until 2 a.m. And yeah. that can make for a very long day. Um, generally, you got to make sure you've got breaks. You've got to make sure you have time to sleep, as Nicola said. You have to have some form of physical activity, whether it's going to the gym or going for a run. You need that. You need a little bit of down time. Maybe not meditate, just to shut it off for an hour. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you're talking the whole day. You're presenting. You're smiling. You are on. And then, you know, you set, usually you leave Fridays because nobody wants an ambassador on a Friday because no <laughs> bartender or bar manager in their right <laughs> mind would want you to come in on a Friday or Saturday. Noted brand ambassadors. Anybody wants to be a brand? So or you are a brand, but do not go to a bar traffic on a Friday. And call. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, then you do laundry and maybe pick up food for one day and you get your Saturday to connect with some friends and you're packing your bag on Sunday and leaving the next day. So yeah. it's, it's difficult, but it's just a different kind of organization or scheduling no i think i think that's all a good point i think you know scheduling sleep is definitely big not drinking too much is probably really big um you know because when I, I used to travel on the road and somebody said travel on the road with dylan my daughter um mm -hmm. i was really lucky Siraki to let me take her with me and i'd have my babysitter with me because i was like i have no place to leave her so if you need me i have to take her with me um like you know and she'd be strapped to my chest and i'd be like setting up events um, you know, and discovering, um, but exercise, I think, yeah, it's a great point. Sleep, exercise, knowing your boundaries, letting people know like, Hey, it's great. I'm, I would love to go party with you, but I got to do this all over again tomorrow. Um, and presenting is exhausting. Like if you're presenting all day long, it's, it's being on and it's mentally and physically exhausting. And then you have to like do emails and whatever. So it's like finding that balance um i think is really really important uh that i think people have to just remember and so i think this is all really amazing advice um this has been fantastic talking to the both of you um thank you so much for joining me um this is probably our longest episode we've done but so much great stuff. <laughs> so i hope everybody who's joined us uh really enjoyed this because i have um it's been great catching up with the both of you 
And uh, if you miss anything, this will definitely be on my website, Tough on the Rocks. So I always post that link up there. You can see all the episodes uh, of everybody and all the great information. So guys, Nicola, Dave, thank you again so much for joining us and uh, be well. And I look forward to catching up hopefully in person in 2021. <laughs> Me too. Thank you both so much for today. Elaine, this is great. Thank you for having us. <laughs> uh, thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care.